Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Independent Living Management presents Pioneers in Disability Rights and Community Organizing, an interview with Linda Anthony. Hi, I'm Jean Kales here with Doug Yuziak, and we're interviewing Linda Anthony. Welcome. Linda, can you uh, share with us how you got involved with community advocacy and uh, what type of community organizing you actually do? Well, I got involved um, uh, through a Center for Independent Living that was opening up in my area of Pennsylvania. Um, I originally was going to apply to be a part-time peer counselor because I didn't know what an indep independent living specialist did. That was the full-time job. But um, I had someone convinced me to try the uh, independent living specialist position, so I did apply for that. and started working at the center. Um, it was just getting off, you know, just kind of starting. And we really had um, no one else but myself and the executive director, and we covered three counties. So for that first year, it was just her and I. And um, she taught me a lot about uh, the independent living movement, philosophy, um, what a center is supposed to do. And I, I guess it was some of my own natural organizing instincts uh, that kind of kicked in then, and I started um, organizing the counties in the three counties that we covered. And what type of community organizing do you, are you involved with now? Well, um, I'm actually working on a grant under the Developmental Disability Council. It's a long-term care or grassroots organizing grant. but. I also am a member of ADAPT, and in that, both of those capacities, what we're doing is um, trying to organize the community to advocate for long-term care services in the community, quality services in the community. So what I'm doing now is really um, providing technical assistance to local coalitions and groups, but at the same time trying to get them to focus their advocacy efforts in a way that they all can work together towards one common goal, and that is quality, effective community services, um, while still maintaining their own identities as coalitions or groups. And what we're trying to do is show them how there are similarities in some of their goals, and those are the things to focus on, and those are the things to work towards. Linda, you mentioned your natural instincts toward organizing. Could you talk about that and talk about what you see as the important traits and skill sets of a good organizer? Well, I, I, was, a, I was the oldest in my family, and um, there were three siblings under me that I, uh, as growing up, had to kind of organize. Um, my mother and father both worked, so being the oldest, you end up being the one to kind of keep it together at home till everybody's there. And so some of that was just by birth and, and the learning and growing process. Um, but then I uh, actually took a job at, at uh, a hospital at the medical records department. Um, I started out like a 210 an hour, but they started teaching me a lot more about medical records, sending me to things, and from that then I became a supervisor and then ended up organizing in a way in that capacity, um, getting people to do things, uh, you know, that sometimes it was stuff that they really didn't like to do, um, paperwork and that kind of thing, but you kind of have to get them to understand how you that has to be done so that you can have time to do these other things that they wanted to do. So I guess some of the natural things I'm talking about were from birth and, and helping to raise the family. But um, then I think I just, as a supervisor, you really have to learn not only how to compromise once in a while, make, you know, not your principles, but you have to be able to willing to give and take in discussions and, and in teaching people how to get to their goal. And you have to really be able to step back and look at the bigger picture. And you have to also um, be able to take it when people don't agree with you. Um, you have to be able to t help them talk things through. So I think that's what I was getting at. Got it. Does the 
the trait what you see is a real important skills of organizers and traits above and beyond what you've mentioned I would say um, most important traits are never underestimate the importance of every individual in the group. I mean, you have to recognize um, the talents in people, I think, and then bring that out. Because in my mind, everybody in the group has something to offer. I mean, they're there, they have the interest, they have the drive. Um, the important role, I think, of the organizer is to recognize what their talents and their contributions can be and then to encourage them to use them. And as I think, there's something good in everyone, um, something everyone can contribute. And once you discover what that is in them, the important thing is to nurture that. Um, I think another important trait of organizing is learning to let go. While in the beginning, and you're just starting the group, you may need to kind of be a lead person. You may need to take charge. The important thing in my mind is to develop people within the group who will then take over. Um, to find that person who is you know, willing to step up to the plate and take over and take charge. And you, once you find that individual, then you nurture that, that ability within them. Um, and you have to be, and when I say let go, people aren't always going to do things the way you would do them. And so you really just have to let them do it their way. And in the end, you often still reach your goal. It just may not have been the way you get there. And that was, I think, one of the most important things for me to learn. Just let other people do it their way. It may not be your way, but it's OK. You know, As long as they're working towards the same goal, um, you will get there eventually. And it may, it'll be their way, but that's OK. So I think that's a, I see that all the time. People tend to want to stay in control, and, but you got to let go so that you can develop more leaders within the group. What are some of the key principles and values for community organizers? Well, earlier I used the word compromise, and I want to be real careful with that because one of the things I've learned in organizing is um, it was always difficult for me at first, how do I wear all these different hats? Um, ADAPT, N National Council on Independent Living, uh, Pennsylvania Protection and Advocacy, of which I was you know, the president of our board. All these different hats often were like, how do I um, make them all work and still feel good about what I'm doing, also not compromising my principles? And then, I, I don't know how, but somehow it came to me that I, st I don't have to compromise my principles in wearing all these different hats. I can stay true to what I feel is very important um, and, and hold on to those principles uh, even though sometimes things fly in the face of it. You know, like you get into meetings where, um, you know, people want to, uh, well, we talk about consumer control. We use that word all the time but we don't truly exercise it. Um, that issue of being in control, uh, some people have a hard time knowing how to do that or they don't want to do it for whatever their own personal reasons and so they don't really exercise consumer control or encourage it um, because of the way they are behaving. If they don't let someone take charge of something, um, instead they tell them how to do it, that's really not empowering the individual to do it themselves. So not, uh, the other thing is I used to sit in like long-term care council meetings, which was mostly providers and a lot of nursing home providers. And I used to try to always be politically correct or I don't know what the term is, but then, like I said, once this revelation came to me that I don't need to compromise my principles, um, I started being very more outspoken. I, if they disagreed with me, it didn't make me so angry that I couldn't talk it out. Um, I just took it at what they said, but then made my point of view also very clear and kind of stuck to my guns. I mean, I think before that, I would have probably just been quiet and you know not really tried to counter what they were saying because I didn't want to 
stick out. You know, I didn't want to. A confrontation can be sometimes hard for me, believe it or not. And um, I, I did, wanted to avoid that. And I wa also kind of wanted to fit in to the room and the crowd, if you know what I mean. Um, so learning how to hold on to those principles, even in a, a mixed or sometimes a negative atmosphere, um, I think was important. And then not compromising on those things, not being willing to say, well, it's okay if we just accept this settlement as it is, you know, like, well, we'll just make sure there's a ramp in there and let somebody else worry about all the braille markings or braille whatever. And, um, I don't know if I'm making this very clear, but just holding on to those, I think, was very important. And then the other thing of nurturing the skills in people that you find. I think is, is vital. Talk about your role models, your mentors, how you use them, and how you teach other people to find and use role models and mentors as well. Well, I've had quite a few role models that I have used. First was my the center director that I started with, Shirley Ray, um, she has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, so her, uh, her mobility is very, very limited. Um, and it was the first individual that I had been around who was so independent with such, you know, uh, limitations. And she kind of taught me about First of all, the value of learning what the law really says. You know, she made me read everything and reread it. And so doing my homework, I called it, um, learning what the law really says. And then she taught me, um, you know, how to, uh, how to be more vocal about things and how to use what I learned in those laws you know, later on when I'm in public settings or when discussions would come up. Uh, so she actually did a lot to teach me about the independent living movement and the philosophy. My role models since then have kind of changed to um, some of the folks in ADAPT, um, Bob Kafka, Stephanie Thomas, especially Stephanie in the way that she is also a woman. Um, and faces some of the same things that women do in terms of, you know, the men tend to take over and, you know, it's hard to get a word in edgewise <laughs> and are my ideas of any value. And she's done a lot to teach me that, yes, they are, um, and that you do need to voice them. And it's okay if you voice something and nobody agrees and they don't like it. It's still important to voice it so that everybody has a chance to hear all these perspectives. And they um, they really amaze me sometimes in that they can take these shots all the time about how they do things, their tactics, you know, people don't like what they do, how they do it, and you got to learn how to let that roll off your back and stay focused. One of the things that always disturbs me is we have a lot of infighting, um, and as I do imagine a lot of groups do, but there is a lot of infighting, a lot of kind of backstabbing kind of things, um, not sticking up for one another. And they've taught me how to not let that change my, my work or my objectives, you know, my uh, moving forward. I've, I've had a lot of things happen over the past few years in terms of my job and my personal life. And, and I've had to learn how to just let them be to the side so that I keep my eye on the prize, if you will. And I think that's probably one of the most important things they've taught me. Um, to set aside all these petty things that are going on and saying, okay, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but how can we move forward? What is it we have in common? What kind of things can we do together to reach our goal? And just keeping people focused. A lot of, there have been a lot of instances where I would have liked to have responded to, to charges or allegations about me or my work, or, but I've also had to say that this is not the forum or the arena for that. Set that aside and let's talk about the 
goal. Let me just probe. Um, you're the first person who's talked about some of the dynamics between men and women in organizing. Anything else you'd like to add about that? I think it's an important piece that we gloss over sometimes. Well, one of the things I've learned, particularly in the area of negotiations, when you finally get to the table, mm -hmm. um, there are those that, that will only speak to men or will only take information from a man. Um, I see that as that's really their hang up, but what I've got to do is if there's information that I think will benefit the conversation or the issue, if I see that they don't want to hear it from a woman or that they're going to kind of blow it off because it's coming from a woman, feed it to a man in the room and let him say it. Um, to me, it's like it doesn't matter who says it or who does it. As long as it is said and if it helps and moves us forward, great. I don't really care who gets the, the credit or the acknowledgement. And if they have a problem with taking it from a woman, fine. We'll give it to a man and let him present it. And if that gives it more validity for them, who cares, as long as it happens. I, um, I learned to put a sign up on my wall that says, you know, there's amazing things can get done when no one cares who gets the credit. <laughs> um, so some of those dynamics come into play in negotiations. They also come into play, though, in an organizing perspective. Um, in ADAPT, you know, the, the men uh, are very strong and very vocal, um, and sometimes it's hard to even get a word in edgewise. And so we've learned, and as they have learned, that you know we do have some contributions to make. And I think what I've learned to do is, I, I, I'm somewhat pretty much a quiet type who will sit and listen for a while, but when I have something to say, you will hear it. Um, and if you talk louder than me, I'll just talk louder than you until you listen to me. So that is something I have learned through this movement, um, that dynamic and how to use it, but also how to recognize that it's there and then work around it. Just to follow up on, on this discussion, is that type of barrier greater or less than what we see in the rest of the community? Well, I, it's probably, uh, to me, it's almost kind of the same. I mean, I see in the business world that going on all the time. Um, I see a lot of women in the business world get frustrated because they, you know, they feel they should have the say or they should be able to present the issue or the problem or the statement. But I've just kind of recognized that if that's someone else's hang-up, then I, I'm not there to help that person become enlightened about the value of female input. Um, I'm there to kind of reach a goal. So, well, I understand the concept of there to reach the goal. Mm -hmm. But would not the fact that you're advocating for the rights of persons with disabilities, at that same time, is there not a responsibility to the individuals within your movement, not necessarily the other people on the other side of the fence, I understand that's their hang up and, and you're not there and it's going to get in the way, but within your own particular movement, should should not this issue be addressed? And are you addressing these issues for anybody that may be dealing with the same type of frustration? Well, we don't talk about it in our movement so much as we do something about it. We put women in leadership positions. We have them running workshops. We have them as day leaders and color leaders and we put them in charge and eventually people have to listen to them. We try to, I hate to say we try to empower them, but I mean I think that is kind of what we do. We nurture their ability as a leader and try to get them to forget about the fact that they're a woman or a girl. Um, and to just focus on those leadership qualities that they have and to bring it out in them. And by putting them out there in the front, eventually I think that that will make other women in the movement feel more comfortable. I mean, the fact that Stephanie Thomas and Babs Allberger um, 
have been some of my role models has caused me to become more vocal and more out there and has has allowed me to uh, cultivate my leadership abilities, if you will. And it has also, I feel braver now about speaking out. Um, a good, uh, we have uh, many times, it's like in the state of Pennsylvania, we have a lot of strong women leaders and we work together. Um, in fact, we have no real strong male <laughs> leaders in Pennsylvania yet. Um, we're hoping they will emerge, but mm -hmm. it has become kind of a woman's movement in Pennsylvania, if you will. It's mostly women with disabilities. So now what, um, what organizing activity are you proudest of? Um, I, I thought about this. I saw your questions. And I think for me, the one I'm most proud of was actually an event that I ended up not being able to even attend. And I think that's why I'm proudest of it. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have a program that provides personal assistance to people with physical disabilities. And it was actually one of the first jobs I ever had. But I also used the program. I knew the value of it. Um, I knew how it had really made me recognize how this disability was not going to end. It was going to be for the rest of my life, but it didn't have to be, um, it didn't have to stop me from living. And it made me feel good to know that there was a service out there that would help me get a shower by someone else other than my mother. I was 29 years old and I felt like I was going backwards. So we have this program in Pennsylvania and every year it would um, accumulate a waiting list of over a thousand people. And so every year um, we would advocate and they would put some money into it and take a lot of those off. But it was like every year and there were people that were ending up going into nursing homes we found because they were waiting so long for services. So we organized, um, we were calling it Tent City. And we were really working long, a lot of hours, you know, a lot of time. And I ended up developing cellulitis in one of my legs. And two days before we were supposed to start this Tent City, I went into the hospital. And, you know, in my mind, I was just very worried about how were they, you know, going to do? Would they still be able to pull this off? But I think we had nurtured enough of the leaders within the group that they carried it off without me even being there. I mean, I remember being in the hospital getting a main line put in my chest and telling them, don't forget your garbage bags, you know, because it was supposed <laughs> to rain. And um, they said, oh, we got them. You know, we got the garbage bags. But I think I'm proudest of that because we, we had planned it, we had organized it, and even though I wasn't physically there, they still pulled it off. I mean, the second week I, I got out of the hospital, I stayed with them the second week. You know, we slept outside. But that first week, they did it, and I was not there. And to me, I think that's the proudest I, I am. How do you get people actively involved, especially with that type of... Uh that type of action going on. It's long term. And how do you just get people rally around that type of thing? Activity? For me, um, I, you, I think we constantly are reminding them of why they're there. Um, people start complaining about the conditions, about how uncomfortable they are. They're cold, they're wet. And you have to keep bringing it back to yeah, you're cold and you're wet, but you know what? You can come and go as you please. This is for people that are in nursing homes that can't go anywhere, that can't get anything. Think about your brothers and sisters who are not free and how close all of us are to that and keep bringing them back to the issue, uh, saying it over and over again. Plus also, you have to make it kind of fun, you know? If we can't laugh at ourselves or, or if we can't uh, enjoy one another's company, it, you're going to have a tough time spending two weeks in a tent <laughs> with them. Um, so you you got to get to know them as people. Can you share, can you share some tips about um, strategy development, zeroing in on issues, 
and even uh, course corrections at times. Well, that's, to me, that's one of the hardest things is developing the strategies because everybody, you know, has their own idea about how it should be done, how you reach the goal. So, but it's very important that you do that. Um, one of the things I've learned is you can't go in with your mind made up about how this is going to happen. And so I've learned to go into a meeting with some suggestions or some ideas, but also with an open mind to hear what other people have to suggest. Because oftentimes I find they have some better idea. And then how do we incorporate that? How do we uh, put all of our ideas into a strategy that's going to work? And parts of my ideas might work, parts of theirs. And so it's, it, it is one of the most difficult things, I think, doing the strategizing. But you really have to go in with an open mind. You can't have your mindset already made up. And you have to be willing to really, really listen to suggestions. And you have to be willing to say, OK, maybe I was wrong about this. Maybe this wasn't the right approach. Maybe we do need to wait a little while. Does that? I think, I think we're OK. I don't know if I answered all your well, questions. How do you? How do you converge on a strategy? You know, what, what type of technique when you're working with everybody, when you develop that plan? What, what, what do you do? Um, well, we start out by stating the problem. Um, and then kind of uh, where is it that we agree upon? You know, what, what part of this do we all agree? And what part of this is, what is a mutual goal? What is something that we do agree upon? I like to start with the positive things. And then um, from that, you say, uh, OK, so we all agree that this is where we want to be. And then you say, well, OK, well, how do we get there? And if you don't get any responses, you start by giving your suggestions, um, by sticking your neck out a little bit, by, by saying, here's what I think. Um, tell me what you think. And Oftentimes, people, by you sticking your neck out a little bit, it, it, it gives them a little bit of chutzpah, and they stick their neck out a little bit, and then they say something. And um, you get them talking. And if all else fails, then you get them mad. <laughs> you say something that's going to you know, really set them off mm -hmm. and uh, push their button. And then that gets them talking. And then you start talking back. And you, by sitting there and being willing to listen to them, really listen to them, and take into account what they're saying and use it, 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 uh, it makes them feel that they've provided a valuable contribution and they'll be more likely to do it again and again. Anything you want to add about, about course corrections when you're in the middle of an action? Or? Um, again, I think it's very important to, and willing. you have to be willing to say, OK, I, I think I was wrong. This was not a good way to go. Um, I like your idea better. What do you all think about that? You know, and OK, let's do that. Um, but admitting that you're wrong. And then that issue of being willing to stick your neck out, um, that's really important, too. Being willing to say things in a room full of people that you know aren't going to like what you say. But you got to say it. Linda, in the activities have you, in, that you've been involved with, can you speak about uh, pulling together various coalitions and how you've gotten, you were able to manage that? Well, when I first started out in the independent living movement, and I was, you know, it was explained to me that centers are supposed to be cross disability. Um, that's what was said, but then when I got out into the real world, into the community, um, folks with mental retardation, I didn't typically see them coming to centers for independent living. I didn't see the aging population turning to centers for information. So I started, um, like for one thing, speaking at area agencies on aging about independent living. Um, I tried to identify, first off, you know, I would I'd talk a little bit about the fact that, you know, oftentimes people don't see that we have similar goals or that we have similar wants and needs. And um, I would talk about those things 
and then say, but I believe that we do. When someone can't get into an apartment house because it doesn't have a ramp, um, it is exactly the same discrimination that someone who can't get into that apartment building either because they're blind or because they have mental retardation. Um, the fact is we're all being discriminated against because we're different than what society perceives you know, that we should be. And so getting them to recognize that I think then is my next step. You know, once I, I vocalize that yes, we do have differences, but here's where we are the same and then trying to unleash the passion in them about people being locked up and people being put away and segregated and separated. And you kind of try to light the fire in them um, once you've gotten them to see that, yes, we do have some similar goal here, and that is to be treated equally. And that, um, I've found has been very successful at getting them to move beyond their um, their single issues. A lot of people used to be worried about uh, us trying to do away with like the MS Society or the Epilepsy Foundation. And was there no longer a role for them? Well, that's that. I don't believe that's true. I think they there is definitely a role for them. There are folks with their particular disabilities that need more intense information, support, encouragement, um, understanding, but there are areas where we are very, all very much alike. No one wants to be put away. No one wants to be segregated or separated or treated like, you know, an animal. Um, so in that sense, despite all these other different disabilities, we do have a common goal, and that is to to live free and, and equally. Um, one of the things and the ways you do that is you, like, I attend their conferences, their workshops, their meetings. Um, you, you listen to them and you hear what it is they have to say. Um, uh, I think a good example of something that happened in Pennsylvania, the uh, Speaking for Ourselves, part of the People First movement self-determination all that I got I started attending their conferences and um, then they came to me at one point and said we're gonna do this March uh, to close down institutions and I said you know um, we have a similar goal here of keeping people out of an institutional segregated setting what if you change the, your um, theme to be a, a March for freedom for all people from all institutional settings and nursing homes are part of an institutional setting and a lot of people don't even recognize that fact. So I said what if we, you were to change it and then you know I think we could get independent living folks to be part of your march and what has happened now and they did that and we kind of collaborated and pulled in some of the centers and now as a result that march for the first time it was like 25 people it was just a speaking for ourselves group. By bringing in the independent living centers, it's now grown to about 250, 300 people we get for that march. We've got mental health consumers now coming, again, because I have you know, gone to their conferences, I have gone to their um, group and done, have done presentations about independent living, about where we are similar, where our goals are similar, um, about the fact that personal assistance or attendant care should be available to everyone you know if it, if you need help getting out of bed it shouldn't be why you need help if, it, if you need help getting out because of your physical disability or if you need someone just to encourage you um, people with mental health issues who may suffer from depression or something they just need encouragement you know every day sometimes and if that's you need that kind of assistance it shouldn't matter what kind of assistance you need, the fact that you need it, um, it should be the criteria, if you know what I mean. Which takes us to the issue of we want functional based programs, um, you know, things that are provided based on the, the function the person cannot perform um, rather than why they can't do it. I guess getting away from that single disability issue. Linda, you You've only talked about some of the issues around 
negotiating and being heard and and listening and going in with an open mind. Um, when you're at the table, when you got to the table after or during an action, and you're sitting there negotiating, can you share any other tips you learned over the years about that process, about what works and what doesn't work? I believe the first time that I've been in negotiations, um, I would let, I would say my piece, and then they would say, you know, the other side would say theirs. And in the beginning, I think I often let them kind of take over the meeting, you know, say, we can't do that because we don't have the money, or we, we don't have the structure, um, we have always done things our way. And I used to just kind of let that defeat me. Um, I, would, I would not keep pushing. I would not try to think of some other way to come at it. Um, which is what I do now. And I would also um, be afraid to say to them, that is just not true. <laughs> you know, I would be afraid to call them a liar, if you will. Uh, so I, I think what I've learned is that we do have some, we have some good information. We know the way things should be. Um, we also know that they can do things um, differently. Um, you can change the process. You can change the structure. And when they want to get down to the money, um, you hit them back with the human element of it. I think uh, one of our really recent successes in Pennsylvania was, um, it was we had taken over our governor's house at one point at 5.30 in the morning. By quarter to six, we had everybody chained to his fence. And um, we... We, uh, of course, ended up getting arrested, but that was five days before uh, September 11th happened. And as most of you know, Governor Ridge was then asked to be head of Homeland Security, which took him out of Pennsylvania. So we were like, a lot of our folks were like, well, you're never going to get anything now. You know, that action was just a waste. Um, we wrote a letter to the then, now Governor Schweiker uh, saying that we wanted to have a meeting um, as a follow-up to what had happened with Governor Ridge, and he agreed to meet with us. And he came into that meeting, I believe, with the full intent of saying hi, goodbye, shake our hands, I hear you, thank you, I'm out of here. And I think his staff intended him to do it that way. We, in turn, as he started to, you know, his he said his spiel about, you know, we only have so much money and and then um, we took it back to the human element. We said, you know what, we sit around in these meetings all the time and we hear the statistics and we hear about the money. And I said, one thing is missing, the human part of this. I said, these are people that you're talking about, people's lives. And so there were five individuals there that then they, and I said, you know, Barb, how would you like to tell him about what happened with you? And the five of them were so perfect. They just, like clockwork, each said their spiel and how each one of them had been someone who had been, you know, in a nursing home and were now working. And that in and of itself was pretty compelling, I think. But we, um, ex we talked about the human part of things in that meeting and ended with, the fact that the state already moves people out of nursing homes in some of its programs, and we pointed those out to him. But we left that meeting, and, and his staff kept trying to get him to leave, and he kept saying, no, no, he wanted to hear this out. And uh, he heard us all out, and he left. And, you know, 30 days passed. We thought, oh, nothing's going to come of this. And so we wrote him back, but lo and behold, he held a, a press conference to announce his budget and he stated during that press conference that he had met with a group of people who had told him they were the voice of those in nursing homes who couldn't get out and that no one ever hears them because they're behind closed, locked doors. And he said, we're here today to say we hear them. And he put in uh, $1.5 million uh, at a time when everybody was getting cut to start moving people out of nursing homes. And he did it in a program 
that will continue to do it now every year because it's already a program that the state has. They just, uh, it was our OBRA waiver and they removed the age requirement. So now when, when the providers go into the nursing homes, they can help anybody, no matter which, what the disability. So I think we did a really good job at, at getting him to think about the human side of this, put the numbers aside and, and approach it from that perspective. I'm sure in your passing you've had to deal with the legislators as well. What type of information can you give as far as the best way to approach our elected officials? One of the things that I tell people is always remind them that you are a constituent. You don't have to tell them if you voted for them. <laughs> but remind them that you are a constituent, a potential vote, first of all. And second of all, remembering that they don't have a lot of exposure to people with disabilities. Every little thing that you could tell them about living with a disability will be something that they will probably take away and remember because they've never heard it before, number one. And number two, they never heard it from people who are actually living with it. Um, one of the best people I find to talk to legislators are people who have been in institutional settings. It's great to have them be able there to talk about it and now living out in the community. And they can see for themselves that these are people that do not need to be institutionalized. Um, they are obviously living in the community and, and living well and prospering. So. Uh, always remembering to provide as much education as you can about living with a disability to me is very important and expressing why it's important to you to live in the community. Um, the thing that I also teach people though is what drives this country unfortunately is the money. The almighty dollar drives the world and or at least America and you have to keep that in mind. Well, if you want to talk about the money, um, institutions cost a lot more than community services. And while you don't want to diminish the human element, um, if you want to talk about money, let's talk about money. You could serve a lot more people for the same amount of dollars that you're, you're using to keep people locked up. Uh, so you have to also present that side of it, um, not only the human element, but also it is a cost savings in most, in I would say, pretty much most of the cases. There are only a few individuals, you know, that would ever be higher than the cost of being in an institution. Um, one of the things I've also learned in, in meeting with legislators and talking to them, they also have buttons. They have things that um, push their button, that they relate with. Uh, we, I've had instances where a legislator seemed like we were getting nothing out of him. He just kept saying, yeah, 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 to everything. And as we walked out the door, um, one of the folks that was with us mentioned that he was from the Epilepsy Foundation. And this particular legislator had a niece who had epilepsy and was familiar with the problems it had presented to the family. Now, we really didn't want separate money for epilepsy, but as it turned out, because of that little sidebar conversation he ended up having, $150,000 was put in the budget for um, epilepsy education for the development of brochures and information to be, to be disseminated to providers. So you have to remember that they also have buttons and, and never underestimate um, what one comment can end up giving you. Um, it may be the button that, that they hear or that pushes something in them that they, they can relate to what you're talking about. Can you talk about the continuum in actions when or if or how things actually need to escalate from marches to confrontation to civil disobedience? Um, for the most part, if you can get things done through negotiation, through meeting, through
through uh, uh, dialogue, information exchange, that is more the, the preferable route to go because it's faster, you know, and everybody reaches that place um, comfortably. But if when you come up against where, to me, it's just the bureaucracy, it's the paperwork, it's the structure, it's the way we've always done things. Um, when you come up against that and all your negotiation, all your talking, all your discussion, you still end up with where you were before, not even one step you know, forward, to me, then it's time to say, okay, now we're going to have to get a little bit more forceful about this. Um, maybe I can give you an example. Um, I'm on our Intergovernmental Long-Term Care Council. For three years, um, we had been working at the table with them about um, assisted living. And in the state of Pennsylvania, there's still no public dollars going to assisted living. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's because of our advocacy. We have said, you cannot have another program begin that is only, only has facility-based care in it. You must also have the other option. So for three years, we had been coming to this table, doing this, you know, working on this assisted living legislation. And we came out with a really, really good product one that allowed assisted living to be provided no matter where the person was, even in their own apartment or house. So we came up with this legislation. We formally presented it. Um, we had had, for three years, the Department of Welfare had been at the table, aging had been at the table, and everybody had kind of come to an agreement around this legislation, and we presented it. And then the Department of Welfare, the Secretary of Welfare, came to our meeting with this one-page flyer with a little pie chart on top about the money. And her response to our presentation of this assisted living legislation was pretty much that we're going to fund personal care homes to be assisted living facilities. Well, I raised my hand as I was supposed to do. As it turned out, I was number seven on the list to respond to her. And up to that point, there were a lot of voices saying, you know, we have worked long and hard on this, and you know, you guys have been at the table. Now you come in with this being a problem. You know, why is that? And it was all very nice and calm. Well, I was the seventh person, and by the time I got the microphone, <laughs> I had just boiled. I had reached a boiling point, and very slowly, I started out very quietly, but my voice slowly started to rise to the point where. I was pretty much telling the Department of Secretary Welfare she could just go, you know what. Um, I took her little pie chart, threw it in the middle of the room, and it floated down to the floor. And as it's floating down, I am in a very loud voice into this microphone saying what a crock this was about how we had sat there for three years. We had worked towards this goal that they had every opportunity to, to disagree with us to not go along with it, and they have the audacity to come in there after three years and to throw this little pie chart at us and to throw everything out that we had been doing for three years. And then, as I'm building up and getting madder and madder, I finally said, you know, you people disgust me. I said, you talk about people with disabilities for three years here like I'm not even in the room. I said, you know what that feels like to be talked about in the third person? I said, and you know what, don't sit here and act like you care about people with disabilities because you really don't give a damn. The only thing you care about is your jobs, your money, and, your, and that's what's on your mind. I care because, frankly, I said I'm an activist. I don't have any money. I'm probably going to end up in one of your systems, I said, and that's why I'm at this table. And I said, you disgust me so much, I can't sit here with you any longer. And as I'm saying that, I'm packing up, and I rolled out of the room. Um, and I understand that after I left, they took a vote and just unanimously decided to accept the legislation as it was, to not touch it, no more discussion. And if I'd have known that all I had to do was scream and yell at them a little bit like that, I would have done it a lot sooner. <laughs> but the point was, to me, the time had come. Enough was enough. We had danced around the issue for three years. We had danced around all these things. And then when it came down to it, they still were not willing to budge. And to me, that was the time. It was time to say enough's enough. And I have to admit, it was a little hard to go back into that meeting after that little tirade of mine. But um, 
and there are some that are very standoffish with me when I go into that meeting. You know, they, they keep their distance. I sit at one of the table by myself for the most part. Um, but it, I think it really kind of opened their eyes. And as I said, the unanimous vote was pretty telling that they got the point that um, we were not going to stand for anything less than what we had produced. Again, that in accomplishing a lot that you have obviously have accomplished, you've had to use the media. What are the, the best ways that you found in order to get the media to work with you? Um, some of it has been confiding in them, you know. They feel a little privileged when you share information with them about what's coming up. You know, I always have to say, but you can't let anyone know about that, but here's what we're going to be doing next week. Um, confiding in them because they are reporters and they, you know, they hunger for information. That's their thing. So uh, I think confiding them and getting their confidence has made them feel a little bit more a part of the group. And then uh, making sure that I have people who are willing to talk to them, to give them some real information about the human element of things. Uh, people that have been in institutions and people who can verbalize that and, and talk about uh, the importance of, to them of living in community. And also then people who uh, can spouse the pr policy jargon, you know, people who can talk about what this issue is about and and to give them some real concrete information. Um, we recently did an action and we uh, asked a reporter that had worked with us in the past, you know, we told him we're going to be doing an action at this drugstore in the mall and would he come along. And um, the owner was giving us the same old stuff about um, the corporation says we can't remove these poles because they're there for security reasons. And then um, our, my response to him was, well, you know what, the bottom line is Judy here can't get in your store through this mall entrance. And as long as Judy can't get through, no one is going to be using this entrance. And then he still came back to me with, but our corporation says, and he started spouting some things. And I said, you know what, would you like to tell that to the Pottsville Republican reporter we have sitting over here on the bench? And then I called him up to the front. <laughs> And he just stood there with his little paper pad writing his notes. Um, he never really ran a story, and I don't know if he ever intended to, but he kind of had already recognized his role in the whole thing. And you could see the manager's face just fell when he realized that we had the media with us. So to me, they're a tool in the box that you pull out when you need to and when it can help. That's, that's, very, that's very good. Um, you talked about confiding in them. I know one of your strategies is to be careful who you tell what to in terms of the surprise quality of what you're doing and where you're doing it. So what kind of things do you talk more about that confiding? Well, you confide to a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, you tell them things that you can tell them, and you act like it's, it's pretty darn important and they shouldn't share that, but you don't really tell them anything going to hurt you. Um, and then once you have them, their confidence in that or, or the fact that you know they feel a little bit of a kinship to you, then when I have stuff that I just can't tell them, then I say, well, you know, I mean, there's something, I can't tell you exactly where we're going, but trust me, it'll be, it'll be good. And then that makes them like, well, okay, you know, they kind of feel like they're a little part of you, but yet you really haven't revealed anything. Staying with the media and its importance. What's your most memorable street theater? Uh, hmm. um, again, around the issue in Pennsylvania of, uh, of people being put in nursing homes. We dug up some information about nursing homes, you know, some statistics, and we found that the the state still ran some nursing homes, some you know mm -hmm. significant enough that uh, it was worth noting. So we held, uh, we got a permit, and on the Capitol um, grounds.
ground, we held a kind of, we called it a public hearing. And we invited the media, we had flyers and packets, and we had folks coming up to the microphone giving their story um, about how they'd been in institutions and now were living in a community and how their lives are so much better. And we did that kind of all day long. It was a very orderly kind of thing. And then it came to be like 8 o'clock at night, and they wanted to shut down the grounds. And so the guy that I had gotten the permit from came over and told me, he said, well, you know, it's getting close to 8, and we shut down at 8, that you're going to have to take your stuff off the plaza area here. He said, you can take it down to the sidewalk, that's okay, but you have to get off of this plaza. So I just looked at him, I said, I, I hear what you're saying. See, I didn't lie. <laughs> I said, I hear what you're saying. But um, then what we did was, when that magic 8 o'clock hour rolled around, we had folks with their vans down in the bottom filled with lounge chairs. They started bringing these lounge chairs up, and we set the lounge chairs up across the plaza. And our folks started getting out of their chairs and jumping in the lounge chairs. We had also made up these, uh, they look like bars, and we, they were big cardboard things. And so we had uh, standing people holding those bars, kind of, you know, closing in the people sitting in the lawn chairs. And somebody yelled, lockdown. And we put a, we had made a banner up that said Pennsylvania State Nursing Home, Administrator Governor Tom Ridge. And we had people go up on the balcony and hang it right under the Capitol dome. <laughs> And uh, we had lockdown, and then everybody was, you know, locked down for the night in their beds in the nursing home. Now they ended up arresting us and and actually taking people out of those lounge chairs. But it was kind of pretty effective because across the street there happened to be a graduation commencement exercise going on, and that's where the governor was supposed to come to give a speech. And all those parents, all those kids saw them kind of dragging people with disabilities off the lounge chairs and putting them in handcuffs. <laughs> so it really kind of put the pressure on them. I but, just want to know if you were in your pajamas. Well, some of us were. Yeah. <laughs> some of us went that's that good. route. Yeah, and some great. of the women had their hair in curlers. And, and immediately after this was a capture. Yes, oh, we had good press. That's uh, very great.